Hello, Jai Hind. Good morning. Welcome to yet another episode of Chanakya Forum Dialogues English. Today, we would be discussing on the Sri Lankan crisis, and we have had enough uh, discussion on the economic part of the crisis. But today, what we will do is we will focus on the the internal politics uh, in Sri Lanka and also how the crisis in Sri Lanka will have an impact on the geopolitics in the region. So, to discuss this, we have with us uh, Mr. Iqbal Athas. He is a award-winning journalist from Sri Lanka. He is currently the political editor of the Sunday Times, and he's also previously worked as a defense correspondent and he's covered the insurgencies and many other war uh, in in Sri Lanka and outside. So, we we have a very eminent speaker with us to discuss on this issue. Uh, Mr. Iqbal Athas, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. And firstly, I hope everything is fine at your end and uh, everything is safe and sound at your end. Well, it is, uh, except perhaps uh, the the situation the country is facing now. As you know, the protests are growing, and the economy is taking a further beating due to power cuts and the non-availability of fuel and uh, also medicinal drugs. So, on the long long run, it's going to have a a bigger adverse impact. Yeah, and my my uh, my question also was you know based on that. that how do you see this current crisis what is the political fallout uh, of this uh, which is going to happen in sri lanka what is the future of the rajapaksa family number one is the future of the government itself as you probably know the government has lost its majority in parliament now surprisingly here is a government which at one point of time had a two thirds vote and they were able to in fact amend the constitution and bring in some very highly controversial provisions but now at the moment they are in a minority and as it happens in our part of the world uh, a lot of horse trading is going on now to shore up their majority so one member from the former president maithripala sirisena sri lanka freedom party has already joined the government but this leaves them still seven members short for a comfortable majority and until they receive a majority their actions will be restricted number one is the fact that they cannot impose a state of emergency or take any other measures or legislate in parliament so their first priority in the long run is to ensure that they have a parliament where they have a majority vote of course the other priority is turning to the international monetary fund for further assistance and uh, those who are familiar with the discussions know that it's not going to be an easy task where the fund is just going to pull a draw and say here is the money to go and spend initially we are told that it will take anything between 6 to 9 months for the discussions to materialize and once it does uh, the imf is bound to cut down a number of areas where the expenditure has been very very high now to give you an example the present government has been militarizing at a rate the army has been growing in number and uh, for some unexplainable reason we have also had what he called a coast guard when the, the role of the navy all these years since independence has been to carry out that particular task so that is one aspect and then we also have our national carrier the sri lankan airline which is swallowing money at a rate so these are some of the areas where they may want cuts in expenditure and these are uh, areas again which are politically sensitive to the government and president rajapaksa himself is a, a pro military man and how he is going to look at it remains to be seen Uh, Mr. Iqbal, the protest uh, on the streets of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, we see that uh, you know more and more young people are there. You know there is you know more uh, uh, probably because you know they have they 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 have never seen such a kind of crisis in Sri Lanka as probably you would have seen in the early days of the LTT and all those things. These kind of thing you know uh, probably would have that that phenomena of how a nation uh, can uh, come under stress for various reasons. but now what we see is that there is a generation of young people who are uh, who are there on the streets and these people what 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 one can make out from the social media is that they want uh, uh, rajpaksa government to go 
and so and but rajpaksa being such a prominent uh, uh, you know leader and the the family itself how do you see their particular uh, you know what is the future of rajpaksa family in sri lanka well i would think the role of the youth is very very significant for a number of reasons that's the next generation which is taking up issues and uh, if one looks at it very closely this is uh, again a kind of hybrid protest there may be a few odd elements here and there who may have cashed in to create problems like for example the incidents that took place outside the president's private residence but other than that if you see the protest have been very very orderly orderly to the point where even the litter at the golf course green or the golf course promenade are collected and disposed of and there is a very high degree of discipline that is being maintained and also what transpires during various meetings and discussions there the fact that there are allegations of corruption against the rajapaksa family and particularly among members who have constituted the cabinet and it is known that the 75% of the resources of the government have been distributed among the family members in the cabinet so one significant factor which uh, the protesters have achieved is uh, being able to convince gotabaya rajapaksa that there are too many members in the family that is why he removed basil rajapaksa his brother from being the finance minister and it is no secret that there have been a number of allegations of corruption against him then he removed chaman rajapaksa who is who is also a minister and uh, prime minister mahinda rajapaksa's son namal rajapaksa who has also been removed from the cabinet so in the recent past we are not seen president rajapaksa talking to the people trying to explain what what he feels about these issues or what he plans to do about these issues it appears that he is more preoccupied in trying to raise the numbers in parliament before thinking of any other measures Uh, to deal with this situation uh, uh mr iqbal you had mentioned about uh, you know the increasing militarization which uh, president rajpaksa has been doing including uh, you mentioned about coast guard and uh, you know uh, and uh, also uh, one of the reasons why the rajpaksa got such a huge majority was uh, post the easter day bombing which happened uh, in sri lanka there was a outcry that you know that security aspects was given much more priority and they believed that rajpaksa being a you know a a a powerful man or a a man with a as you mentioned a military background and all probably he can give that security so my question is that uh, of course the easter bombings did have an impact you know in bringing the tourism down and you would have seen even that during the ltd days and you mentioned about hybrid war you know the hybrid protest also so is there a chance of you know these kind of elements also misusing or you know rather misusing making use of this particular crisis which is happening in sri lanka and yet again you know uh, we see the the ugly faces of terrorism uh, coming up in sri lanka again i personally don't think uh, it can take the form of terrorism but there certainly is the likelihood of others cashing in on a situation like this uh, when i say others there could be elements within the administration who want to help by precipitating a situation other than that we haven't seen any sort of sinister outside elements getting involved but having said that there is also another factor to bear in mind this has also unified the the main religions in this country for example buddhists then the uh, singhala buddhists then the muslims and the tamils now in the last two days we have seen a big influx from the north and the east uh, to the golf is green now this is in marked contrast to what uh, president rajapaksa has been propagating he has been propagating a, a rather disturbingly racist line where hardline clergy have been making very racist remarks at various stages and we saw them even speaking out um, just a couple of days ago but that has not taken roots uh, fortunately and uh, this being the holy month of ramadan we have also seen situations we are the at fast break time we see muslims going and sharing their food uh, with the others who are taking part in the protest now yesterday was very striking because it was the national new year the 
most widely observed holiday in Sri Lanka, there was one entrepreneur who wanted to remain anonymous who di distributed 1,500 packets of biryani to the others who were taking part. So this had brought, bound them closer to each other and uh, sort of created a new awareness, which I feel is spreading to most parts of the towns and uh, villages. That's, that's very uh, nice to hear that, uh, Mr. Iqbal. My, uh, now I'll take uh, from here. Let's move into the the uh, you know the geopolitical aspects of this particular current crisis. Uh, uh, and often uh, discussed aspects is the Chinese involvement in Sri Lanka and what kind of uh, infrastructure projects uh, which they did. And you know there's a talk of uh, debt di diplomacy and uh, debt trap. Uh, these kind of things uh, are there. So in the backdrop of what is happening now in Sri Lanka, how do you see? Sri Lankan China relations going ahead from here. And I believe that they are yet to sanction a 2.5 billion credit line, which I think uh, it's, it's in the uh, in the discussion stage, which they have yet not ratified uh, or given it to Sri Lanka, which Sri Lanka wanted. So how do you see with the current crisis, with the popular, you know, un unrest and, uh, and people know that, you know, there, are, there has been a, uh, there has been a role which has been played. How do you see Sri Lanka China relations going ahead? Well, that is uh, that's an interesting question for this reason that the Rajapaksa administration fell head over heels over China and some of the projects that they embarked upon. Now, there are questions now, take for example, the Martala International Airport in the deep south, that's in Harbantote. There's not a single, this is the only airport in the world where there are no flights operating. Well, it's emptiest airport. MTST airport. Similarly, we have the Hambantota port, where it's now being used mostly for transshipment of cars and so on. So these factors were necessitated more out of political compulsions, like uh, uh, developing one's own electorate and uh, providing employment uh, and uh, developing that their own area. And the kind of money that have been spent on that have been enormous. But having said that, uh, I believe, I, it is my view, that China has uh, no cause to be very happy about what had happened. This is one of the reasons why they have refused to reschedule some of the debts that they have given us. Even to a smaller country like Maldives, they have helped them. Although they have taken up the official position that uh, they usually do not reschedule debts. But it's quite clear that uh, diplomatically, when you look at it very closely, China at the moment is very disturbed about the way the Rajapaksas have used them and dumped them. Yes. Okay, uh, that, that's very interesting. And how do you see the, you know, uh, Sri Lanka is also part of the Belt and Road Initiative of the, with the Chinese. So uh, uh, with, from here on, and I know that there is a lot of talks of uh, within the Chinese establishment of, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of rethinking on, and, you know, uh, remodeling the BRI itself. So the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in Sri Lanka per se, with this crisis, how do you see that going ahead? Well, it has not gained very much traction here, but that is not to say that the initiative is altogether gone, because we have seen a, a change in the, the, the diplomatic structure in Colombo, and we see a, a more aggressive ambassador who have been speaking out publicly, sometimes casting real aspirations on third countries, like for example, recently they were to receive a, a renewable energy project in one of the islands of the northern Jakarta Peninsula. Yes. When that was withdrawn, uh, the one of the diplomats uh, thought it fit to even have a press conference at a five-star hotel in uh, in Colombo and cast aspersions on the others and say that this was missed out. In other words, they were exp expressing their displeasure. So to those who watch it very closely, these, these, these concerns are very clearly becoming obvious. And uh, now moving on to uh, India-Sri Lanka relations. And I think this uh, we always have had a very close relations with uh, uh, India and Sri Lanka. And that's, that's, we all know that. So, and during this crisis, I think, you know, India, go Indian government has uh, reached out and, you know, helped in whatever possible manner, whether it is in the credit line, whether it is fuel, food, medicines and all those things. How do you see, uh, what is the impact of uh, the Indian assistance uh, uh, for a, you know, a friend 
uh, who is in need how do, how does the sri lankan people how does the sri lankan public see the indian help uh, at this point of time of course that impact has been enormous but before i say that one has to look at the other aspect as well that is the fact that when there was this quote unquote love affair with china uh, one of the interests that were overlooked were that of india and there were concerns right throughout of india saying that you promised this to us you don't deliver you promised this to us and you don't deliver so this time when the government leaders started leaning on india for help their first position was you know first deliver to us what you promised then we'll think of the others hmm. having said that now today we are able to live without darkness at nights only because they are fairly coming here and if there is availability of drugs of you know, to to some degree it is because of the indian support that is coming here now we are told that in may in the first or the second week of may all the indian largest will be used up that is the credit line as well as uh, the, the shipments that are coming in now on top of all that they have also sent food stocks like some 200 uh, thousand tons of rice and so on so the biggest question is what happens next and this is why i keep saying that the worst is yet to come because then the power cuts cannot be regulated because there won't be any way in which you can run your turbines for a while and then shut it off because you won't have the fuel to do that mm. so that's a very serious situation we are walking into i'm sure uh, you know both uh, india and sri lanka also would be thinking on such lines and to overcome these issues which you mentioned my my, my, my you know question now is that uh, and you mentioned briefly about what is the worst is yet to come why do you feel that uh, you know of course i understand the economic aspect but can you explain a little more that why is the worst yet to come in uh, sri lanka why do you say so why i say that is because why do you think did we sort of uh, face this string of protests you know i have often been asked this question whenever prices were going up whenever shortages were available when there were power cuts i said we are a resilient nation and we are not like the latin americans or the africans who take to the streets at the slightest thing but how wrong i was is proved by what is going on today because today it hurts every single sri lanka men women children so now that it had happened you know there are children who want to go to school their breakfast cannot be made because they don't have lpg gas the cooking gas now the worst hit are those who are living in apartments because you can't even have uh, wood fired uh, kitchens in these areas so when you travel from colombo take for example 30 or 40 miles outside you will see queues of uh, 500 600 meters people lining up their gas cylinders so now that the shortages are going to continue and that too in the backdrop of uh, uh, extended power cuts or even much longer power cuts it's only going to aggravate the problem further then we also have another uh, economic damage aspect take for example the tea factories now we have been boasting that we are one of the best producers of tea in sri lanka because of the power cut and the way it's been timed the factories can't function so the tea production has come to a virtual halt in some areas uh, they had to wait till the power is given to, uh, to to produce the tea so this is causing them a very big effect so are the apparel industries so are the other industries so all, there was a time when we had these problems some of these industries shifted to bangladesh so this kind of thing could happen again so there is also this debate that is going on over foreign investment there is a school of thought that uh, sometimes this is the black money sent out by politicians that are coming in and it's not the genuine investment that is uh, been brought back to sri lanka there may be some wisdom in that but nevertheless we don't receive the kind of investment then take the tourism industry for example it is true in colombo and a couple of other places you have generators uh, powering the the project the, the hotels and so on but if you go to the coastal resorts there are no generators and sometimes the buildings are two and three story high and the tourists will have to walk up and the kind of service that you offer is much less now so all this is adding up except the one sort of 
it sort of goes through the propaganda and see what's going on. So th these are also causing a very big effect. Now the government is suffering because the last several months we have only been having tourists from Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Now today the government is accommodating them because they can't get back to their country. <laughs> so whatever they earned in the form of tourist revenue is all gone. Yeah. Okay. So there was also a lot of mismanagement in that respect. Absolutely, and it's really uh, very worrying uh, to hear that, uh, Mr. Iqbal, that you know the things are really bad. My final question to you is that we saw some sort of, you know, some people at least from Sri Lanka, you know, moving as refugees towards uh, Tamil Nadu and such like places. Do you see, or do you, what do you feel that you know would there, if the situation really goes out of control further, as you as you think it should, it it would. Uh, would you see the, uh, an increase in the refugee movement from Sri Lanka towards India? That is a very fearsome prospect because this is not the first time we are facing it. When the separatist war was going on, we saw that happen in a much bigger way. And uh, now there is another aspect that I come to come to the fore. That is, we see the presence of those from the north and also from the east taking part in these protests. And uh, they are also feeling the shortages. They are also feeling the lack of fear and so, so on. So the, the crunch is beginning to tell on them as well. And uh, there have always been allegations that uh, the, the North in particular is very heavily militarized and uh, movement of people as a result is restricted. So this is what, and this is a subject which came up even in the UN Human Rights Council uh, just a couple of months ago. So the government has not been letting, uh, let, sort of letting up on those areas. So this, this could very well con contribute to it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Iqbal. I think in the final, I, what one, one can make out is that, you know, when uh, the basic necessities of a human being, when it starts affecting, it does not look at the color, it does not look at the race, it does not look at the religion. It does not look at anybody, it is just the human being who is affected. And that's how, you know, what you said that everybody is now uniting together, uh, even with the, so yeah. much of differences, it was there. So that is, I think, mm -hmm. one of the takeaways of uh, what we can see. Thank you so much, Mr. Iqbal, for taking the time out and speaking to us. Uh, thank you to all for watching. And we will be back again with yet another episode of uh, Chanakya oh, Forum Dialogues English. Chai Hind.